question me as long as The answer is right in the one. chat window. Because I went back and read the chat like two more times, mm -hmm. and I highlighted all the answers. And it's it, right in the chat window. It's right there. Okay. Yes. Um, everyone will get better on the quizzes. Okay? Again, we're learning to think on our feet, so to speak. Yeah. Um, we're learning to read with precision, in detail. Okay? By the end of this course, you will be there. And the quiz scores, everyone goes up. Okay, I watch it every semester. Oh, and <laughs> literally after, yes, literally minutes after the, taking the first quiz, I start getting emails from students. It's panic. <laughs> oh, and, I, and I just tell them, okay, relax. It's, it's a learning process. As I stated last week, no one has ever taught you how to read computer science material. And it's filled with words you, you've seen your whole lives. Okay. I know exactly what that is. Well, in discrete precision, probably not. And that's the level of understanding we need. Okay? If it was easy, and really, we can all learn how to do this. If it was easy, everybody would be working in IT and making six figures. So, so don't, you know, don't feel bad about it if you didn't do as well as you normally do. It will get better very quickly. Okay. Um, so today, of course, we're starting, or yesterday, starting Lecture Module 2. Lecture Module 2 is Chapter 2 from the text, and in Blackboard there is a quiz on it, of course, and it's Linux Lab 2. Okay? Linux Lab 2, you will be connecting to the Hudson Valley ACAD NX server, which is an Ubuntu server, Ubuntu Linux server. You'll take a screenshot and you'll submit that in Blackboard, upload it in the Assignment 2 area. Okay? Do not skimp on the reading, okay, in Linux, okay? You'll be tempted over time, okay, to just do the Linux lab, follow my instructions. Yes, I could lead everyone here through all the Linux labs, not a problem. But that's not the goal or the outcome. What we want to be able to do is to assess and think for ourselves, okay? And by the end of this course, you will be ready to accomplish and take on anything. I guarantee it. You may not see it now but I guarantee you will be there. Uh, so I'm going to start here on CS100.com, Lecture Module 2 here. There's some information that the textbook doesn't cover that's, that's kind of a critical foundation. Um, and again, the, the textbook doesn't approach this from that business IT organization triangle perspective. Everything's integrated, and we need to know that. Uh, I don't know if anyone is keeping track. I know I gave everyone a lot of reading and a lot of things to do in the first week. Um, but as you go on CS100.com, again, just take a look at what some of the recent emergent topics are. If you have time, of course, go to the actual link. Um, interestingly, you know, I don't know if you saw this, U.S. Army is considering replacing thousands of soldiers with robots. You know? Uh, you know, and we've all seen, probably all seen the Terminator, you know, things like that. We're looking at very real things in our immediate future um, that we need to be concerned of. Um, are concerned about. Okay. Um, other things, you know, privacy, big data, social networking, Internet of Things. I won't go into them. We're going to look at these. Over the course, slowly, as we build our foundation, more and more we'll have more and more discussion in the class. Okay. First, we need a nice platform, and then we can really start talking about the emerging topics. Yeah. So, what do you mean by emerging? Commercial new. Yeah. I'm sorry for using that word. Um, and we use these words, emergent, disruptive, you know? And that's, yeah. When we look at today's environment, what's it characterized by? Emergent, things are coming up new every day, you know? And we need to be ready for them. Um, things are changing. So often I use the word transitory, okay, fleeting. Um, and then disruptive, just change happens. We see businesses, you know, coming into fruition. We see businesses just going out of business. Right and left, long established institutions that have been around 30, 50, 100 years, you know, but suddenly they're gone. Again, similar to the Industrial Revolution, we are living through a, disrupt a period of disruptive change, you know, the emergence of the information revolution. And nobody's really saying that, you know. When people were living through the Industrial Revolution, they weren't going, they weren't saying, hey, this is the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> it was 50 years after the fact, okay? But that's where we are now, okay? Architecture and infrastructure, okay? Everybody here knows the difference, right? We've all used the word architecture, okay? Architecture is a strategy, a plan, a blueprint, okay? Whereas infrastructure, 
is everything necessary to support that blueprint. And we can think about this from building a house. You know, an architect creates a blueprint. Can you live in that blueprint? No. It's not until, of course, the engineers and contractors come in and build the house, okay, and build the infrastructure. Okay. Now, how does this apply to IT? I'll give just an example, and we'll look at many examples throughout this course. Architecture. Okay. Look at an organization. In an organization, you know, they have a sales force. Do I allow the sales force to buy their own devices, or do I supply them with a, a device? Okay. If I allow them to buy their own devices, well, organizational culture, they're going to be very happy. I'm going out and getting an iPad. Okay? But then the organization is left supporting it. And that's what the organization has to think about. What's that cost? Cost is infrastructure. Okay? If I buy everyone in the organization, all my sales staff, you know, Lenovo T61, some rock solid platform, Apple, MacBook, then when they have problems, they call into my help desk, I know exactly what they have. Lenovo. I don't have to go through what computer do you have, Dell, what model, okay? What service packs do you have on your operating system? What's your virus? What are you doing? What are you running? Okay? It becomes very complex. The help that support people I need need now to need to know be very knowledgeable. They need to know many platforms. I mean, they need to know all about applications. Okay. Return on investment, total cost of, of um, the total cost. It may be better for the organization to have everyone on a singular platform. Now, I may pay more for, say, a MacBook Pro and send my sales staff, staff out with MacBook Pros. However, cost of hardware is probably the least of my concerns. It's often easy. I can, you, know, you can go out and buy a $100,000 server. Anyone can do that. It's more expensive to hire a system admin where you're paying $100,000 a year to run that server, that recurring cost of $100,000. But we're going to look. People are the most important resources of your organization, especially when it comes to IT. It's your expertise. Okay? They're going to define or limit your capabilities. Okay, so architecture and infrastructure. Architecture is the blueprint. Infrastructure is everything that goes into supporting that architecture, of course, which is all the hardware, the networking, but don't overlook. People are that most important resource. Okay. I'm not going to show this video in class. Please watch it. It's only two and a half minutes. It's the von Neumann architecture, which is our architecture today. Um, and I did, did bring this back. Okay, this is the Raspberry Pi. Um, this is a computer. Okay, this tiny little thing. Please leave it in the foil so that we don't shock it and ruin it. Um, <laughs> But we're going to this in the presentation today. We're going to be looking at the system board, okay, the CPU, the ports. This has everything. Okay, you see the C you see the system board. CPU is that little black thing there. Um, it has audio in and out. It has a micro USB and a normal USB. This would be for say a monitor or a keyboard. It has an Ethernet port. Okay, uh, they're using these. A lot of people are using these in startups for robotics, things of that nature. You can build a whole Linux web server on it. You want to access your movies when you're on spring break in Florida. Here it is. You want to stream movies in your house. You want to create a music system that plays in every room. Well, you buy three or four of them okay, and network them together. Um, about $29 and the price is dropping. Um, you know, things are changing. Um, so that's take a look and you'll see exactly what we're talking about today. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay, we're going to look at memory and the storage hierarchy. Okay. Um, take a real quick look just here. I'm going to present it when, when we go over the in the PowerPoint slides. But um, just open this up. It'll open up in a new window, and it just a, a picture is worth a thousand words. And the textbook doesn't really talk about the memory hierarchy. It's also known as the storage hierarchy. Okay. So I did present two things. And just for clarification, last week I presented the information hierarchy. Remember, the information hierarchy was that data, information, knowledge. And the example I used was that social security number, you know, 02367-4327, meaningless. But if I put in a table with SSN as the column header, right, everybody knows it's a social security number. And then inside us, we know other things about it. We have knowledge about it, right? It's a unique text, okay, text, not number because we're learning about encoding. 
and we know there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between a social security number and a person. And that's really our early focus here, and it's actually our focus throughout computer science or computing, is that how do we represent things? How do we take that real world and do useful things on it, constraining, constraining it to a computing um, environment? Okay. Memory. Please know this. Okay. And let me let me ask this first before we get started. Can anyone tell me the difference between memory and storage? Okay, I heard that one word. Any others? Exactly. Okay. All right. Memory, right? Memory is temporary. Okay. It is volatile, which means if I turn the PC off, the contents of memory go away. Okay. Storage is non-volatile. It's persistent. Okay. Um, which means if I turn the computer off, of course, what's on your hard drive is not going away. Hopefully. Okay. So there are two examples of it too. Memory. An example is random access memory, RAM. Another example would be ROM, read-only memory, which is important in how a system boots. Okay? Storage, a you know, example, of course, is the hard drive. We also have flash. We have external USB drives, things like that, is storage as well. Also, the byte is the smallest addressable unit in memory. Okay? We, we're going to learn, of course, the byte is 8 bits. The smallest addressable unit in storage, say on a hard drive, is going to be the sector, 512 bytes. Okay? And this is going to be important. We're going to take a look at this shortly. Okay, so scrolling down, here is the chapter two presentation. This is, of course, last semester. Um, I'll replace it with today's uh, presentation here. Um, we're going to look at the fetch execute cycle. And the, and the textbook does a, does a reasonable job presenting it. Um, here's a fetch, fetch execute simulator I found. And I ran the simulation and captured it. Um, tomorrow, I am going to go over numbering systems. Okay? Um, and note, on Thursday, I will be in this classroom for extra help. Okay? And I'll be here from 10 to 12. Um, and I'll try to get here before 10, so maybe, maybe 9.30. Um, if you are having any difficulties with Linux Lab 2 connecting to the Hudson Valley server, come in and we'll, we'll do it here. If you're doing it on your notebook, bring your notebook. We can, of course, use these Macs. Okay, we can do that. Um, if you have any questions on numbering systems, conversion between decimal and binary, and again, I'm going to go over this until tomorrow, but if you have questions, know that, and I'll try to uh, represent this tomorrow. So I'll be here Thursday from 10 to 12. So kind of just an open time, I'll be in this building. For, for all those people that have, are in this building, sorry. Um, so just just know that. Um, so anyway, here's the simulation. I think it's about 20 minutes long. Um, yep, 20 minutes. Please watch this tonight because this will really demonstrate what is going on at the CPU level, that fetch, decode, execute cycle. And again, it's all coming off that input processing output model okay, that we I, I introduced last week. Um, we will go over the boot sequence, okay? And I know I've asked a lot already, but at some point this week, and I will ask the question tomorrow, can someone tell me what the boot sequence is, okay? There's a real quick introduction on Webipedia or Wikipedia. Um, you know, take you five minutes, and then I'll show you this. This is super cool, for lack of a better word. I'll probably do this tomorrow. So let's jump to the PowerPoint presentation now. Keep me on track. Keep me from digressing too much. Okay, so to begin, digital data representation. In order to use a computer, we have a need to represent information, so data and programs, in digitally. Okay? When we talk about digitally, we, we're talking about two states, on and off, but of course a computer can, can represent this using 0 and 1. Okay. We're also going to be working, of course, with the binary numbering system. Binary numbering system, two states, 0 and 1. We're very familiar with the decimal numbering system of 10 different 
digits. All done? Thank you. So, again, we cannot represent or we cannot put, you know, if I want to do a traffic simulation, I cannot put cars and stoplights into the computer. What do I need to do? I need to represent them digitally. So what I'm talking about is symbolic representation. Okay. Now, as a basis, we need to know that the bit is the smallest unit of data that a computer can recognize. And there are times at a systems level um, that you may be working with bits. Of course, if you're working in assembly language with flags on the, on the uh, CPU, um, you're working with, you may be working with bits. Typically, though, we're working with in memory at the byte level, or even a higher level. And when we look at higher level languages, we're looking at symbolic representation int x, you know, if you're in Java. Well, I've created a variable called x of type integer, which is reserving some set amount of storage space. Okay? So the byte is the smallest addressable unit in memory, but every byte has two things associated with it. Contents and an address. Typically, we want to use the contents, but we have to access the contents through the address. So it's kind of different than the way we think, the way our brains work. Okay? We're not really conscious of where the information is stored in our brains. You know, I want to add 2 plus 2. I don't think about, well, where's 2 plus 2? Where's that algorithm in my head? I'm not thinking about the address. I'm just accessing the contents. But in a computer, we have to be aware that to access the contents, it's often done or, or necessarily done through the address. Now, maybe the program or the, the system, the operating system, is hiding the details. You know, I want to open a Word document, okay? Well, I don't know exactly where it's stored on the disk. The operating system will per perform that translation and that abstraction and retrieve it for me. Now, I want you to note something else. The bit, and the textbook doesn't really focus on this, the bit is denoted with the lowercase b, whereas the byte is denoted with the uppercase, or capital B. Okay. Now, for numbering systems, again, we're going to go over this tomorrow. And by the way, I'm going to teach it in tertiary, okay, which is base 3. The reason I'm going to do this is because if you understand the algorithm, you can do it in any base. Okay? You will be independent. Rather than just learning binary, okay, I can do binary. Learning decimal, I can do decimal. Learning hex, I can do hex. If you learn the algorithm, you can apply it to anything you encounter. Okay? Not too many people present it like this, so, um, but it works. Okay. Um, the numbering systems, if you get a chance to read in advance, I highly recommend it. Okay, it is cs100.com. It is right out of this lecture module, too. Um, it's in the submenu, numbering systems. Um, if nothing else, read what the textbook has to say. It has a nice appendix on it, too. Um, I've worked on this for about eight years or so, this presentation, so I think what I do is a little clearer. Um, only you can be the judge. And, and don't feel shy and tell me it's not clear. Okay, I can always improve. It's one of the things that we try to do in CIS. We try to continually improve. And it's actually part of the ACM Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. We have to be open to criticism, to input. Because that's the only way we improve. Okay, people tell us what's wrong with our systems. Okay, so bytes, of course, we need to be able to communicate, at least in English, and speak about large quantities of data, whether it's memory or storage. Okay, we talk about bytes. We don't talk about bits. You know, I have a you know eight gigabyte computer. I don't say I have a sixty-four gigabyte gigabit. You know, computer. And we talk in bytes. Um, so we, we assign prefixes, or you pr use prefixes. Of course, kilo is a thousand, mega is a million, giga is a billion, tera is a trillion, peta is a you know, quadrillion. And we go forward. Um, typically, you know, user level, we're down at this range, terabytes. Companies like you know, Google, things like that, they are up in that yottabyte or even larger, using larger amounts of, of storage. So here's, here's my first trick question. So read this carefully. Many people, of course, know this, but how long will it take to download a one megabyte file on a one megabit per second connection? Can anyone tell me? 100 seconds. 
Nope. One second. Nope. Do, do the math. Eight. OK? One megabyte file. How many bits in a byte? Eight. So how big is that file in bits? Eight megabits. One megabit per second, eight divided by one, eight. OK? This is where we need to be very careful. OK? File sizes are presented in bytes. Right? How big is that file? How big is your source? You know? Whereas networking speeds, we're talking about bits per second. And quite often, peripherals, too, when we talk about USB connections, Thunderbolt connections, we're talking about bits per second. So at some point, you will be evaluating, you know, your company is going to video conferencing. Here are the requirements. Don't make the mistake, OK, of calculating what your network requirements are without performing the translation between bytes and bits. Okay? Again, this is all goes back to reading everything in just discrete detail, precision. And you will become accustomed to this. OK, so data and program representation. We need a way to represent. We know that the computer uses digital, OK, or binary. Um, so it, it has 0 and 1. Of course, in our world, we, are, we use the decimal numbering system and symbols. Um, now, take a look at the decimal numbering system. Ten symbols. Okay. In a single decimal digit, what's the smallest number I can represent? Zero. Okay, very easy. What's the largest number I can represent? Nine. Okay. Two decimal digits. What's the smallest number I can represent? Zero. Zero. Okay. What's the largest number I can represent with two decimal digits? Ninety-nine. Okay. So be aware of this. While the largest number I can represent with two decimal digits is ninety-nine, what's the range of digits I can represent? Zero to ninety-nine. So one hundred distinct representations. So going back to the byte, the byte is 8 bits, right? The largest number it can represent is 2 to the 8, 256, or, or excuse me, 256 distinct representations. The range, the largest number it can represent is 255, 0 to 255, okay? So be aware of the number of addresses, but also the range of addresses. Um, okay, so real quick, and again, we're going to spend an entire class on this tomorrow, uh, for the most part, um, is a depiction of the decimal number system and the binary number system. We know decimal, okay? The ones place, the, the tens, the hundreds, the one thousandths, okay? And of course, these are derived from 10 to the zero, the ones place, 10 to the first, the tens, 10 squared, 100, 10 cubed, 1,000. Okay. The binary system, base 2, okay, 2 to the 0, the 1's place, 2 to the 1st, identity, 2's place, 2 squared, 4's place, 2 to the 8th, 2 to the 3rd, the 8th's place. Thinking ahead of myself. Going back to here. So what is this value? One of the things I'll tell you, I'll present tomorrow, which which is why it's difficult quite often for students to understand binary, is we are such good information processing specialists, we've forgotten the algorithms. Okay? What is 7,216? Is that a 6? Yeah. Um, 7 times 1,000 plus 2 times 100 plus 1 times 10 plus 6 times 100 plus 6, 6 times 1. Okay. Straightforward. We know that. Binary. What do we have? 1 times 8 plus 0 times 4 plus 0 times 2, plus 1 times 1. So what do we have? 8 plus 1. So quite often when we're doing the translation from binary to decimal, we're kind of doing it by inspection. Okay? And for the network, how many networking people do we have in here? Okay. And this is what you're familiar with. You know, you just do it. You've been doing it for so long, by inspection. We'll do that, but we'll also learn the algorithm. And when we get to programming languages in, say, week 13 or 14, will actually use a recursive algorithm to get it. So what fun. OK, so we know the computer uses digital or a binary system. Okay, 
Um, but we also need to represent other things. We have, we have programs, we have data, okay? And when we talk about data, recall what I said with SSN, right? We're recording it as text. So I need a symbolic representation for my character set, everything on my keyboard. You know, all my, you know, A through Z, lowercase, A through Z, uppercase, numbers, all these function keys. And I can do this in a byte, okay, using the ASCII coding system. So ASCII uses one byte, okay? Again, 256 possible variations, okay? Um, so you see the character set and its ASCII representation. And here you see, of course, 8 bits, 00110000 the character 0, okay? So again, with every character on the keyboard, as well as special combinations, you know, control C, control Z, you know, function F11 or something like that, I can also encode those. So I can encode those using ASCII, everything on the keyboard. Okay, that's great for English. Okay. But it doesn't really support a global perspective. Because if now if I look at, say, Arabic you know, character sets, um, Oriental character sets, we just don't have enough. There's not enough um, room in one byte to do this. So we use Unicode. I'm not really going to talk about EDC, DIC, that's IBM's and I'm not even sure how much it's used anymore. Um, Unicode, when it first came out, it came out, it was proposed as 16 bits. Okay? So in ASCII, in a single byte, I can represent 2 to the 8th possible combinations, 256. If I have 16 bits, 2 to the 16, okay, 2 bytes, I can now represent over 16,000 characters. Okay, that's great. That's going to accommodate, you know, all the Arabic numbers, the Hebrew letter system, things like that. Um, but it still won't support everything out there, say, especially with the Oriental languages. Okay? So Unicode has moved to a 32-bit or 4-byte encoding system. And, of course, 2 to the 32 is, what, 4 million? Okay? So with 4 million characters, Unicode can support virtually every character on the planet. So it's truly a global representation. Okay. Now, for a few of these slides, we're going to look at graphics and audio, things like that. We, again, we have entire chapters um, in the textbook on multimedia, so I'm not going to present it in detail. And I'm actually do, going to do more demonstrations when we get to those chapters. But what's not presented at this point, there are two major classifications of graphics. There's bitmapped and there's vector. Okay, vector is more of an object-oriented, scalable, and we'll look that, introduce that later. But what our phones, what our scanners are doing, they're using bitmapped images. Um, so, what is a bitmapped image? Well, imagine, question. Imagine if you will a, an image. You're putting it on a scanner, or you're taking it with your camera. It doesn't really matter. A bitmapped representation overlays a grid. Okay, so a graph putting a graph over the picture. And for each cell, it's going to sample what are the color qualities. So I'm going to record the color qualities in each cell. Now the clarity or the resolution is going to, the resolution is going to depend on how tight that graph or grid is. Okay? You know, I could have a, you know, a graph with 16 squares or 64 squares. As you can see, the higher resolution I'm making the cells smaller, so more they're going to more accurately capture that component of the picture. But with the picture itself, I also have to set aside storage for my mapping. Okay? I could use a single byte. Right? With a single byte, I have 256 distinct representations. And I could use you know, three bits for red and three bits for blue or something like that. But it would look kind of cartoony. Okay? Because I'd have a few different shades of red, a few shades of blue, green, and you know, things like that. Um, so 256. Um, but we've seen, you know, 24-bit color, right? We divide 24 by 8, right? Because as soon as we see bits, I also want to think, okay, bytes, because we're addressing everything at the byte level in memory. 24 divided by 8, of course, is 3. And we're all familiar with, you know, red, green, blue, RGB, right? Does that make sense? I can now see how that maps, okay? I have a byte for my red component, 
I have a byte for my blue component, I have a byte for my green component, 24-bit color. Okay? Um, and you see even higher, you look at the graphics card. By the way, do we have do we have any gamers in here? It's a gamers call. More questions to follow up today. Um, you know, gamers, you know, 32-bit color. Okay, 32-bit, you have actually another byte, because now you can actually encode how the light is reflecting off the surface. Is the surface smooth? Is it textured? Okay? Is it wet? Things of this nature. And you can do that with 24-bit color too. But um, the, of course, the higher, the more storage I have for each cell in this bitmapped graphics data, okay, the better I can do. The closer I can get to true color, what we call true color. Okay. So audio data, again, and I'll go into this when we get to multimedia. But, and we'll talk about formats and MP3s and AC and everything else. Uh, think about audio data. And I won't, won't go into too much detail. But audio, of course, is a wave. Continuous. Right? How do I convert that or represent that digitally? Well, first of all, there's a temporal component, a time component, right? Because the wave is moving or recording over time. So. I have a sample read. So at every, you know, 60 times a second, 120 times a second, of course, really we're talking about, you know, hertz, cycles per second. How many times am I sampling this waveform? And when I do sample it, what's its value? Okay? And when I'm encoding that value, very similar to what I just presented in graphics data, the more space I have reserved the more precise I can be in obtaining that sample, that value, that sine wave at that particular point in time. Bit depth. Okay? So this is what you see when you're looking at MP3s. What are you looking at? Sampling rate, you know, 44 kilohertz, 44,000 times a second, or 48 if you want to go above CD quality, right? And then you have a bit depth. Now, of course, if you multiply that, you know, 44,000 samples per second, and a bit depth of 16, 44,000 times 16, what, am I, what do I have? I have my streaming rate, bits per second, okay, that is required. And we're, we'll look at this. It's actually very simple math. We'll look at this when we get to audio data. Video data, okay? And I'll jump ahead because video data, um, I'll actually introduce something right now. Um, video data, by its very essence, is compressed. I'll introduce compression right now. There are two types of compression. There's lossy and lossless. Okay? Lossless, of course, you lose nothing. Lossy. Lossy, when I compress something using lossy compression, I cannot get all of the original back. Lossless compression is used whenever I have data. Okay? If you're compressing your hard drive, right? Or you're compressing a database. You don't want to compress your hard drive to save space and then try to find something and your computer operating system comes back and says, sorry, that's gone. History, bye. Okay? So data always uses lossless compression. Lossy compression we use when human perception is involved, a JPEG. Okay? At some point, the human eye can't detect differences. Or it may just be in our best interest. Okay? Because if I use some type of compression, what's, what's my end result? I have a smaller file size. So downloads. Think about that. You know, I have this tiny little cell phone. Of course, I have nothing. I lost my iPhone yesterday, so I have nothing in my hand. I'm looking at my hand. Um, I turned on my, you know, find my iPhone. Literally an hour after, I, half hour after I lost it. And I find that my cell phone's been turned off. So they obviously know someone had the intent to steal it, you know, because they turned it off so I can't find it. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, so anyways, lossy compression. I may not want to download this high-resolution image to my cell phone. You know, I'm paying a lot of money to Verizon for my data plan. I don't want this, you know, high-resolution file taking up all my bandwidth. And we'll talk about that in web design, okay? Because the web design, on the other end, you should not be pushing high-resolution high photos down to someone's iPhone or my iPhone, wherever it may be in the world. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so lossy compression in terms of perception, MP3s. Okay, past a certain point. By the way, and I forget how many musicians do we have in the room. We'll, we'll talk formats too. Um, 
you know, past a certain point, can your ear detect the difference between a 296, you know, representation versus 356 on an MP3? I don't know. My best friend asked me no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, any, I use 256. Anything above that, um, still get the base. What, what do you think? Any, any input? 320. 320? Yeah. yeah. And it, it depends. You know, I, I started my MP3 connect con collection when I had a small hard drive, which, and I was, way back then it was like, yeah. save space. And now I think, darn, I wish I had recorded that higher. Now I put it all on Google Drive, so when you take it off, you don't want lossless because it's going to take up like 10 megabytes. Right. Now. Nice. So. Okay, so lossy versus lossless compression. Lossy, human perception, lossless data. Why do we compress? Save space. Okay, so the system unit, well, so I passed, passed around this, the Raspberry Pi, um, you saw the system unit. It is that, um, oh, sorry, I'm thinking about the system's board here. Um, this is a moving target systems, system unit. Um, you know, this, the text presents this in a very PC-centric perspective when things are changing, you know, the PC tower. Um, how many people still have desktops? Okay, of that group, are you guys gamers? Yeah, okay, so, all right, so you th we'll just throw that out. Uh, so, yes, gamers, and by the way, gamers, how many of you built your own systems? Same group, same core group. It is, it is one of the best things you can do, build your own system. Um, you learn a lot. So, but things are changing for the for the rest of us. Uh, you know, the the iPad users, uh, you know, the, the Mac users. Typically, you don't go inside the computer anymore. Although that new Mac Pro, I don't know if anyone's looked at it. Um, with it, you can upgrade it, and that. Has anybody looked at the new Mac Pro? Yes. Okay. Look. Look at its specs. Well, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Okay, yeah. Garbage can. Yes. Right. Uh, in fact, we'll probably see a Microsoft commercial to that extent, you know. <laughs> um, so anyways. Okay, so but things things are changing. Um, you know, the system board now, of course, it's inside every computer, not just your desktops, it's inside your notebooks, inside your phone, inside the iPad. Um, and of course, a lot of these new mobile devices or Macs, you, you really don't upgrade um, components. What do I want to say about the power supply? Um, because really, we're going to look more and more at mobile computing, because that is the way of the non-gaming uh, population is moving forward. Um, when we look at mobile devices, what are the main constraints? That's what we need to assess. Battery, like. battery right there. Power, battery. OK? Uh, yeah, connection states. Uh, heat. What else? Heat. Heat, yep. And, and heat and power go hand in hand, and speed, you know? You have a higher CPU. Anybody overclock their CPUs? The gamers? OK. So you overclock your PC. You're running it faster. It's going to be hotter. Okay. You better take precautions to keep it cool so you don't fry your system. Um, so when we get, going back to mobile computing, yes, power. Input output. OK. You know, the, you're trying to use your thumbs on a text. Now, voice recognition is coming. We're going to look at that. Output, again, you're constrained by the small screen size. Um, so again, in mobile computing, it's always a trade-off. You know, you're trying to get a good balance. You know, what is, again, what does the typical, typical person need in terms of power for a day's use? Um, but we'll look at that. All right, the CPU is, of course, where the processing takes place. CPU. Um, it says the vast majority of processing, yes, you can have graphics processors, things like that. And more and more, we're also seeing many things converge on the CPU, especially with mobile computing, you know, the system on a chip. Um, that may be the end, you know, result down, you know, years in the future. Um, so we'll have to see what happens. But the CPU, its very essence, has, I'll jump right over this too, um, not really what I wanted to get to. The CPU has two main components, the arithmetic logic unit and the control unit. And you will see this in that fetch execute cycle simulation. So please, please watch that tonight because it will really bring this all into focus. Um, when we talk about dual core, quad core, we're seeing you know, even higher in even personal systems. Uh, um, of course, many CPUs support 
multiprocessing. And we'll learn the difference between multiprocessing and multitasking. There is a difference. Um, note that when you add CPUs, you're not going to double the throughput. Okay? So a two-core CPU is not 100% faster than a single-core CPU. Okay? It's actually more of a curve. Um, so but we'll, we'll take a look at that as well. Um, processing speed. And again, if the focus of the industry has changed. Um, we, we are still seeing increases in speed. But right now, the focus is actually on getting things smaller for several reasons. One, for mobile, mobile devices. Of course, the smaller it gets, the better. Um, smaller devices typically require less power. So a smaller battery or the same size battery can let you run it longer. Um, but think about just the scale of it. As I shrink a CPU, the distances between the components is shrinking. So the latencies, the transfer latencies, moving data around it become quicker. Okay? So all this is, is, is kind of a good benefit. So again, we may not, the, the industry may not be trying to just eke out more and more gigahertz. They're trying to become smaller, more power efficient, and, and as a result, they're going to be um, faster. Okay. Word size. Word size is very important. Um, 32 or 64 bit computing. Okay? And it's not important for the way that the general public thinks it's important. Right? Well, yes, if you're working on 64 bits rather than 32 bits at a time in a single chunk, okay, you're doing more work. True. The true increase in speed comes from moving that data. Remember what I said? Interconnections are the major limiting factor. If I have 32-bit word sizes or 64-bit, or well, I'm going to have buses to support that. 32 bits, of course, is 4 bytes, 64, 8 bytes. So think about the throughput, the difference between a 4-lane highway and an 8-lane highway. That's important. But also the addressing. Okay? With 32 bits, okay, because that's the word size, that's what the machine instructions, what addresses can I support? 232. Remember, byte is the smallest addressable unit in memory. So if I only have 32, 32 bits for my addressing, the most memory I can use and access is about 4, 4 gigabytes. Okay? 4 gigabytes is not big. Okay? As soon as I go to 64, 2 to the 64 addresses, I can now support you know, my 16 gigabyte systems. But, okay, gamers, what are you guys running? So you 16, what about what about how much memory are you running? Oh, okay. eight, 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 eight. eight. Anyone sixteen? I've got the space still for it, but I, I'm kind of it's four. Not really <laughs> Money talks. Money talks. Um, and we'll see when it comes to upgrading your system. Of course, what is one of the biggest um, advances you can get is to increase your RAM. Why? Because of this memory storage hierarchy. What is the memory storage hierarchy? As I move out from the CPU, my speeds get slower and slower. But of course, it becomes more um, cost-effective. Okay? I can afford to purchase more. If you think about the CPU, okay, it's moving 2 gigahertz, okay? 2 billion cycles per second. Recall what the hard drive was. Seven, let's, for example, 7,200 rotations per minute. 7,200 rotations per minute, 2 billion cycles per second. Okay? These are eons apart in terms of speed. So as I move out from the CPU, which means registers, to my caches, L1, L2, L3, then getting even slower out to my memory, God forbid I have to go out to my hard drive for data. And here's, a, here's an important piece of uh, an important understanding. I cannot manipulate data, not change data, or process data when it's out in storage. So if I have a database and I want to change a field, or you have a you know, Microsoft Word document and you want to change it, you cannot go out to the hard drive and change it. What do you have to do? You have to read it into memory, change it, process it, and write it back out to storage. All processing takes place in memory. Okay? So think about this. Not only do you have to read it in and access that hard drive 7,200 rotations per minute, I have to process it, 
and write it back out, 7,200 RPM. So what the CPU does, kind of in a single instant, at 2 gigahertz, 2 billion cycles per second, it's waiting twice on this hard drive, rotating 7,200 rotations per minute. Okay? This is what slows down your system. How do we speed up our system? Increase your RAM. Keep everything in memory. If you have to go out to your hard drive, and the person you're competing against on your game is working in memory, you're coming up short. Yeah. Yes, I, I've seen that. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 But let's let's think on the other side. It's it's also the game developer is not developing or putting out graphics that are going to grind your system to a halt. If you look at today's games, they're not really, you know, movie realistic. Okay, um, why? Because of the constraint the processing on the client side, they're not going to push out a game that's going to slow your system to a crawl, requiring that much graphics processing. Um, so as, the, as your speeds get quicker on your PC, I, I will show you some things. Because the, real is this, real, the realism that's out there that actually can be achieved is right around the corner. So again, these things are kind of moving lockstep. The problem is that they're not going to go above the consumer level of right. core gigs because they would limit their base so much that they would get so many complaints and stuff, they're never going to do it. So, you know, not everybody owns gaming. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, like, so they code to the lowest common denominator they can. OK, so moving on. Um, so I presented bus width, memory, we know, RAM, and ROM. Again, please review that boot sequence. We know that RAM is volatile, measured in bytes. Okay. Something wrong with this picture. It's horrible. I can't believe the textbook did this. Uh, what's that first address? Zero, 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 0001. In computing, we always use zero-based addressing. We don't waste anything. We start counting at zero. Never do we start counting at one. So what is memory? Again, it's that one long contiguous array of bytes. The byte is the smallest addressable unit in memory. It has both contents and an address. Um, flash memory, I'm going to... We're going to look at this in storage. Um, and there are differences between NAND and NOR. NAND is better for writing. Uh, NOR is better for reading. But we'll look at this next week in storage. Uh, heat sinks and cooling, um, not really going to say much. Someone did immerse a computer in vegetable oil uh, to keep it cool. It worked. Uh, so that's totally a double Yeah. <laughs> take, take, ah. take, take it out and cook your Thanksgiving <laughs> turkey, you know? <laughs> Or maybe you do it at the same time. I don't know. Uh, buses, many different buses. And again, they all operate at different speeds. And I do present this in the fetch execute cycle uh, simulation. So note that the CPU front side buses and stuff are moving a little bit different than the system buses. Again, that memory hierarchy, hierarchy storage hierarchy. As I move out from the CPU, things get slower, but they also become more affordable. Right? Um, with External buses, things are kind of converging, which is kind of nice in a way. You know, everything goes to a USB. You connect everything through a USB. And USB 3.0 is now, what, 5 gigabits a second? But people are actually realizing that, which is nice. Uh, Thunderbolt, which is, of course, the Mac, um, it's up to 20 gigabits a second now. So it's just a great platform for, say, video editing, things like this. Uh, so again, we're kind of seeing the obsolescence of all these individual connectors. Um, 
instance. So the CPU, um, again, watch, please watch the fetch execute cycle simulation. As I go through all of this in detail. Um, so I won't really go through it now here. That's that. Oh, the, the fetch execute cycle um, is memorizes fetch decode execute. For some reason, the text likes to throw the store in. In most computer science texts, you will not see this. It's just fetch decode execute. I think that's about it. Making faster. That's it. That's it. Okay. And pipeline processing. The one thing you need to know about pipeline processing is if you move to it, the computer supports it, it's more expensive. Why? I have many things in the pipeline. I need more pipes. I need more buses. Buses are expensive. So that's it. Um, again, tomorrow we'll do the numbering systems. Um, and then probably a few things to tie up some loose ends. And again, note, Thursday I will be here, um, hopefully 9.30, but definitely 10 to 12. So she, do you need any assistance whatsoever? Um, that's it. See you tomorrow. There labs on CIS 100 that I have to do? Um, we're up to Linux Lab.